All right, y'all. I do believe I am live. Hold on. I'm trying to tell all my folks that I'm live. And Facebook won't open Messenger for some reason. I don't even understand that. But anyway, uh, let me get my Insta going. Let me get my Insta going. Insta going. Insta going. Technology, man. When it works, it's great. And when it doesn't, you got to deal. So this is, is an intense, no more genies tonight. It's super intense. So I already know I'm gonna have to revisit the subject because again, the subject's so intense. All right, hold on, let me get my Instagram going. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'm on Instagram live, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I got to tell my group. Okay, log on my Facebook page now. All right. Now, uh, hold on. I'm still letting everybody know. <laughs> so I can start right on time at 7 o'clock. Still, still trying to let everybody know I'm on, but I've noticed that when I come on late, people think I'm not coming. <laughs> so, got to come on early and give people time to get on. Give them time to get on. Okay. Okay. All right. I've got my luck going. Still, still trying to let everybody know time to get on. No, sis, don't head over to Instagram. I said I'm just putting Instagram. I'm just getting it started. Okay, my sister's here. Great. So now I'm just saying I'm broadcasting on Instagram at the same time. Uh, so no, you don't have to head on over there. Okay, 7 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Getting my title on there. Okay. All right, here we go. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your grace. Thank you, Lord, for you always being available there to us, oh God. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness, oh Lord. Thank you for your mercy. So we come before you, oh God, just to hear from you, Lord, so I must decrease so you can increase. So flow through me right now, God, forgive me for any sin, wash me clean, and let the Spirit of God flow through me, and let whatever said be what you want to be said, to the glorifying of your name, to the edifying of the saints, and to the terrifying of the demons and the mortification of unbelievers, that they would be mortified to live one more day without you. I'm looking for you to do great things, oh God, and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word tonight. I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. No More Genies teaching tonight is we don't have sex no time. I know you say, Prophet David, you don't lost your mind. No, I haven't, because the Holy Ghost tell me to say this, but you got to wait a second, because I forgot my water. Hold on one second. Hold on, Instagram. Oh, 
okay. <clears throat> and the funny thing is, I said to myself, let me not forget my water, but I got my water, so okay. So the live prophetic word tonight is really a long title because the full title is How We Gonna Be Married and We Don't Have Sex No Time. That's the actual title. I said, David, I don't understand how you be talking like this. You even lost your mind. No, I haven't. Holy Ghost <clears throat> told me to say this, and I'm going to show you exactly where that's coming from. So we're going to start from the top, and here it comes. The Song of Solomon. If you're not familiar with the Song of Solomon, it's right in the middle of the Bible. Uh, Song of, hey, what's up? There's uh, Alexis. The Song of Solomon was written by King Solomon. King Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba. It amazes me how people keep forgetting that. That Solomon's parents are David and Bathsheba. That's right, that Bathsheba, okay? The one that he committed adultery with and the one he took from Uriah and all that. And he brought all that trouble down on his house after he brought Bathsheba into the palace and the first baby they had died. That's right, that Bathsheba. That is Solomon's mama, okay? So David had about seven or eight wives plus some concubines and King Solomon 100X that because King Solomon had a hundred wives, excuse me, excuse me, 700 wives and 300 concubines, 700 wives, 300 concubines for a total of a thousand women. Okay. So there's four, uh, no, three, three main speakers about marriage in the Bible, Moses, Solomon, and Paul. All of those men had different experiences. Moses was married at least twice. We don't know what happened with his first wife, Zipporah, if she left or died. We know that Moses got married again a second time, and his second marriage was to a black woman. And that's why his brother and sister got mad at him. And God struck Miriam with leprosy and bleached all the color out of her skin for speaking against her brother. Because her brother had a face-to-face -face relationship with God. And God was like, you should have feared my servant Moses. That's Moses. Apostle Paul was not married at all. So everything that Apostle Paul talked about from his uh, marriage teachings was by revelation from Christ and by the wisdom the Holy Ghost gave him, but not from experience. King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he was a child of a couple that got together through an adulterous torrid affair. So I say that to say that some knowledge comes from book knowledge is academic. Some knowledge comes from revelation knowledge is stuff that God shows you. And some knowledge comes from experience is stuff you've been through. And all three are in the Bible. Revelation is in the Bible. Academic or book study or stuff you can figure out by studying science or life experiences in the Bible. Then there's straight up experience, meaning you've been through it. All three are in the Bible. So you need to hold that in your mind as we go forward. So the Song of Solomon is one of those books in the Bible that a lot of scholars just do not know what to do with because they can't deal with the fact that there's a book about romance and passion in the Bible, which doesn't make any sense, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. It doesn't make any sense that so-called religious people or whatever lose their minds over romance or passion or sexuality or the way this bride and this groom are talking about each other like that's dirty or that's wrong or like God didn't invent that. God is the author of passion and hormones and our attraction and human sexuality and procreation and all that. God is the one who thought that up. God is the one who literally hand drew Adam's and Eve's body with his, home, with his own hand. God literally carved out the body of the first man and then took some substance from that body and literally carved out the body of the first woman. So how in the world people got this idea that romance and passion and love and intensity and sexuality and all that somehow doesn't come from God, that that's just not as much a part of God's creation as everything else you're praising for is beyond me, I don't understand. But I'm a prophet, okay? We have to say stuff that other people won't say. So I'm used to people thinking I'm crazy or calling me names or whatever. You say, I don't care. 
I'm thinking what the words say. And right in the middle of a Bible, there's a book called The Song of Solomon. It's really the Song of Songs or the Canticle of Canticles. And it's talking about that this is one of the preeminent or maybe the preeminent song poetry that Solomon wrote about being in love. This particular woman is believed to have been the daughter of Pharaoh, the, the one wife he should have stuck with, <laughs> the one woman he should have stayed married to instead of adding all the other women. But this is talking about their relationship. That's what a lot of scholars believe that the, the, the bride in this passage is talking about. Okay. But <clears throat> it's very much as much a part of our human experience and as much a part of God as everything else we praise him for. So you see that as I go through that. So I'm going to start off reading in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter one, and then I'm going to tell you who's talking as I go, because they kind of alternate on who's talking. So in Song of Solomon, the first verse is the Song of Songs, which is Solomon. I'm going to start at verse two. Verse two and three and four are the woman talking, the bride. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Now, what most folks don't know is that the Song of Solomon is giving you a playbook for romance and passion in your marriage. Once again, I don't want to stand people. <laughs> The Song of Solomon is giving you a play, but a lot of people don't understand why the language is the way it is. But remember, when the Spirit of God breathed on people to write the Bible, the Spirit of God had all of us in mind. So a lot of things are written in the Bible so that no matter what generation of people was reading it, you can get the principles out of it. You need to understand the context and the time, but there are principles in the scriptures that you can apply to your life in your situation now. And a lot of people don't understand that the Song of Solomon is a play by play book to help you with that romantic, passionate connection in your marriage. Well, Prophet, tell how you get all that. I'm about to show you. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. A lot of folks don't know how to kiss. A lot of husbands and wives just, y'all just, you know, get that little peck on the cheek and y'all go about your business because you don't know how to kiss. This woman said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. So Solomon must have known what he was doing. So there's clue number one, you need to learn how to kiss. Number two, it says, for your love is better than wine. Now wait. When somebody say they so in love with you, it's better than getting lit. <laughs> I'd rather be with you. Being with you make me more tipsy than it does getting lit. That's intoxication. Then it says your anointing oils are fragrant. Stop. That means the man smell good. She's saying your cologne is great. So what has she said so far? She said that he's a good kisser. She said being around him make me swoon to the point where it's better than being lit. And she said, that cologne of his is great. Now, can you already see how, how we just stop doing these things? That when you first meet somebody, you do this and you just stop doing it? But that ain't what she's talking about here. She's talking about why she's attracted to Solomon. Then she says, your name is all poured out. What does that mean? It means you got a good name. That means that people light up when they mention your name. And there are very few things more attractive to a woman than a man with status. Where your name has power, where your name means something when people call it. Therefore, virgins love you, all the unmarried women. Draw me after you, let us run. Draw me after you, let us run. Draw me after you, let us run. You know what that means? She want to go on an adventure. Let's go on an adventure. Let's run somewhere together. And then she says, the king has brought me into his chambers. That means you got to have somewhere to bring her. 
All that's in the Bible. I know, I know your brain is exploding. All that's in the Bible. Look at all that stuff. Look at all the stuff she's saying about why she's attracted to Solomon. And you will begin to get your clues about, about how that attraction works. Let's flip. The next verses are verses 8 through 10. This is Solomon talking about her. If you do not know, O oh most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats besides the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, uh, I know that sounds funny and it sounds crazy and doesn't even sound relevant. I'm about to break it down for you. Solomon said that if you didn't know, you're the prettiest thing I've seen all day. Solomon said, if you didn't know, you're the most beautiful woman that I know. You think your wife don't, don't want to hear them compliments? Then he says, following the tracks of the flock and pastor your young goats besides the shepherd's tents. Now you said, how can that possibly have any relevance? And how can that possibly be romantic? He's telling her to use our terms. He's saying, I got you. <laughs> he said, if you need some gas in your car, I got you. <laughs> if you got some livestock that needs to be taken care of, I got you. That's what that means. That he's saying, Pastor Young goes beside the shepherd's tents. In other words, I got plenty of grazing land for all your resources, all the stuff you're dealing with. I can cover everything you got going on. Solomon saying to her, I got you. So first he said, started off with a compliment, said, you're the most beautiful woman I know. Then he said, whatever you got going on, I covered, I got you. Okay, there's enough room in my garage or my garages for your car. I compare you, my love, to a mirror among Pharaoh's chariots because they were regal and noble. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. What's he talking about? He talking about uh, pearls and pendants and necklaces and jewels. And you know how when you buy your wife something new, Solomon's talking about how good you look with your jewelry on. I bet you didn't know the Bible got this real, did you? It's going to get real. I'm just getting started. Okay? So that's Solomon talking to her. Okay? So I'm going to keep going. Next, we're going to go through uh, verses 12 through 14. This is the bride. This is the woman talking again. While the king was on his couch, my spikenard gave forth his fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Now, what's that got to do? I'm finna break it down. He said, while the king was on his couch, my spikenard gave forth his fragrance. Spikenard is an old English word for perfume. She smelled good. She smelled good. She said, while he was chilling on the couch, what he smelled was my perfume. It gave forth his fragrance. And a whole lot of women are, why can't I get my husband to pay attention to me? Just put some perfume on. Well, he busy watching the game, put some perfume on and watch what happened. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. Now, myrrh was one of the things they gave Jesus when he was born. It has to do with a crushing. You get the most fragrance out of myrrh when you crush it. It has to do with him being broken and the sacrifice, the sacrifice. Haven't you ever noticed that when somebody sacrifices for you, you fall in love with them more? Are y'all making any sacrifices for each other? Think about it. Are you making any sacrifices? Is there any place in your life that you've been willing to be crushed for their sake? Think about it. Let me give you a practical example. What if y'all been arguing about something and you said, you know what? I'm just going to let that go. I'm not going to have an attitude. I'm not going to try to be right. I'm not going to try to prove my point. I'm just, okay, you know what? We ain't going to argue no more. Just that humble spirit, just that humble posture changes everything. Are you willing to be crushed so that your husband can come lay down on your chest safely? Then it says, my beloved is to me. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. Don't get what I'm saying twisted. I'm not talking about abuse. 
It says, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. So that's talking about new life blooming forth. So in other words, <clears throat> when you get around your spouse, do they make you feel alive? Do they make you feel like they're bringing out the best in you? Can you say, I'm better because you in my life? And if I'm feeling stale, when I come around you, you light me right back up like it's spring. Is that the way y'all feel? Is that the kind of stuff you say? Now, uh, verse 15. This is Solomon talking. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Okay? How is that relevant? Because he's complimenting her. He said, behold. He said, look at her. He said, I'm looking right at you. If you don't know that women want you to look in their eyes when you talk to them, because they want that personal connection. He said, behold, you are beautiful. There it is, more compliments. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. That's a specific compliment on something. And women love that. So you can't tell me that Solomon didn't know what to say to a woman because he had a thousand of them. I think the old boy might know something. So I know y'all didn't know that right in the middle of the Bible was a play-by-play -play about how to relate in your marriage. It's right there. I just read it to you. Okay. Do you remember the first time you fell in love? Do you remember that rush, that electric river that cascades and tingles all over your body? It's tears, it's pain, it's longing. It's not being able to get them off your mind. Do you remember that? You remember the first time you felt that? Okay. Well, let me tell you the difference. Let me teach you something about men and women that you may or may not know. You probably know this, but some people don't. So I'm going to throw it out there. Women are designed by God to bond. And women are designed by God to bond for life. That is why women never forget their first love. For the rest of their days, okay, they will never forget their first love because they're designed to bond for life, okay? And 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 that bond is going to be there until they die. That's why women come with a seal. And so that's why their experience of the love experience is very different from ours. Uh, so women have the power of first love. Men have something different. We don't have a seal in our bodies. We don't have a hymen like women do. We have a seal in our hearts. Because women have the power of first love, but men have the power of great love. The power of great love, the power to sacrifice yourself and all that you have for the one that you love. That's the love of Christ inside the heart of a male. That's why when a man, was that song, when a man loves a woman? When a man loves a woman, he, there's when a man is with the love of his life, there is no resource he won't give. His time, his money, his name, himself. But just like women only have one first love, men are only gonna love that way one time. There's only one great love in a man's life, just one. You can see it sometimes with widowers, with a man that spent 30, 40 years with his wife and she died early. You can feel her in the house. If you've ever been in the house with someone who lost their wife, you can feel her all around him because that was the love of his life. You only get one of those. You get this many. See, my friend, you only get one of those, okay? Now, let me show you how deep this runs. If you have small children, or you have like, you know, little cousins, young cousins, or you have nieces and nephews, and I'm talking about really little kids, like elementary school kids, like, you know, maybe even kindergarten, first grade, get around them when they play in, and don't say anything and listen to them. You're gonna discover something. You're going to discover that the females are always planning to be in love. Girls have been planning on being in love since they were little. But you will notice with the males, boys don't really talk that way. And boys don't really necessarily act that way. So by the time, let's say a woman gets a proposal and she's 22 years old, 
by the time a girl gets proposed to, she's been dreaming about that moment for 20 years. 20 years she's been dreaming about that moment for 20 years. Males don't really work that way. So that's why when a man falls in love, it, it hits like a freight train. That's why men get so discombobulated. That's why men just get so, sometimes we stammer and all that because men have not been planning on that like girls have. Girls have been planning on being in love since they was little, but males, boys, generally we don't work that way. So when it hits a man, it hits really, really hard and it feels like it hits out of the blue. That's why so many times we just get so homina, homina, homina. Okay? Prophet Taylor, what's this got to do with Jesus? I'm getting there. Just relax. Because this is not, this is about the Lord and us tonight. Okay? So women have that power of first love and women have the power to bond for life. Okay? For life. If you want to see a fictional example of that, watch the movie Titanic. In the movie Titanic, Rose, old Rose is 101 years old. And when she's talking about her experience on the Titanic, she's about 19. At the end of the movie, some say that Rose goes to sleep and some say that she dies. But I want you to notice when the camera sweeps across her room, all the pictures she has are things that she talked about doing when she was with Jack. And whether she goes to sleep at the end of the movie or she dies, what she dreams about at the end is Jack. Okay? Because women never forget their first love. And men have the power of great love, but a man only gets one of those. So <clears throat> that's why, especially for men, when you get that rush of new love for the first time, or when you know you found the right one, when this one is the one, that's why it's so overwhelming, especially for us as males, because we haven't been planning on it. But when that hits, it, I, you can't describe the impact of that. So my point in bringing all this up and saying all this, because I'm going to deal with some marriage stuff in a minute, but you're like, what that got to do with the Lord? My point in bringing all that up is, where do you think we get that from? Where do you think we get all that from? That power, that 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 electricity, that bonding, that sacrifice. Where do you think we get that from? We get that from the Maker, the one who made us in His image. And I know a lot of people don't think about God in that way. Because you've been taught a bunch of religious stuff. But it doesn't even occur to you that everything that you've experienced from the time you first felt the, the pain of love, the pangs of love in your heart, the power of first love, the power of great love, all of that comes from God. And, and a lot of people are taught, especially by our religious institutions, that sex itself is something dirty. That's not true. God invented sex. God is the one that gave us reproductive systems. When God first mentions us, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the earth and over everything that creepeth on the earth. You know why God said that? Because earth is our kingdom. God has his kingdom. God is sovereign over all. God is sovereign over everything he made. But his kingdom where he lives in heaven is where his glory is. You can't be like God without a kingdom to rule. So he gave us the earth realm, a glory filled realm with the glory of all the things that are under the sun. Because it's our kingdom. Because you can't be like God without a kingdom to rule. And then God showed Adam the system that he had because all the animals were paired off. A Mr. Lion had a Mrs. Lion, and a Mr. Hippo had a, a Mrs. Hippo, and a Mr. Giraffe had a Mrs. Giraffe, and Adam looked around, and he, he didn't find anything for him. And that's the object lesson that God used to tell him when God spoke the words, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper that is fit for him. Why 
Why wasn't it good for Adam to be alone? Because you can't be like God without someone to love. So number one, God said, we're made in his image and let them have dominion. First thing God said about us is here's your kingdom. That's how you know God is the great king. Because if we're made in his image, he said, well, you can't be like God, but you got a kingdom to rule. That's why as man goes, so the earth goes. People still don't get that. This is our kingdom. When people say, well, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? Because we keep choosing evil. That's why. It's our kingdom. I know. I know that's blowing your mind because you've been going to church for 30, 40 years. Never heard what I'm saying. You've been going, you've been taught by your religious training to blame God for stuff. Never occurring to you that God meant for this to be a relationship where we ruled our kingdom on earth the way he rules his kingdom in heaven. How do you know that, Prophet Taylor? Because that's what the Lord said to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed the reverence be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would you have to pray that if it was automatic? This is our kingdom and we are made in God's image and God wants us to rule our kingdom the way he rules his kingdom. So as man goes, so the earth goes. That's why everything is just so messed up. It's the groaning and travailing of sin because of the evil that we do. That's where that comes from. Okay. So number one, can't be like God without a kingdom to rule. Number two, you can't be like God without someone to love. But number three, God said, be, uh, be fruitful and multiply. So the first thing he said about us was that we, made, we were made in his image and we got dominion. But the first thing he said to us as a couple, as a family, was be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Okay, so number three, you can't be like God without the ability to create little images of yourself. And that is what children are. Haven't you ever heard somebody say, you look just like your mama? Haven't you ever heard anybody say, you sound just like your father? I know I said, <laughs> I look like my father. I sound like my father. I just, there's no way I'm anybody but David Taylor's son. I know that. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard, had somebody say that to you? You sound just like your daddy. Well, of course you do. You're the seed of your father grown in the womb of your mother. You're the fruit of their bodies because you can't be like God without the ability to make little images of yourself. That's what children are. Therefore, God is the one that gave us our reproductive systems. Are you trying to tell me that Adam and Eve didn't have reproductive systems until they sinned? You realize that don't make no sense, right? <laughs> So, number one, we're made in the image of God and you can't be like God without a kingdom to rule. Number two, made in the image of God. You can't be like God without somebody to love. Number three, made in the image of God. You can't be like God without the ability to make little images of yourself, which is what children are. And I'm trying to connect in your mind all those things that you are ashamed of, ashamed to talk about, ashamed to face, ashamed to admit that you feel. Because you've been taught by religious people being saved, especially people that are super saved. Because some people are just regular saved, but some people are super saved. Like my pastor said, some people are a bishop. He said some people are archbishop, and some people are archbishop deluxe. Because <laughs> some people are super saved, and them super saved people are always selling this idea that being a Christian means you lose your humanity. That's ridiculous. If I got to be the only person on earth to say it, I'll stand by my black prophetic self. That's ridiculous. Being human comes from being made in the image of God. But when it comes to matters of love and family and children and sexuality, we have been so beaten down by religion and we have been so beaten down by fear, toxic fear, toxic shame toxic guilt and condemnation until you can't even be honest about how you feel anymore. Because people say, oh, you ain't said, I thought you was a Christian. I am a Christian. I'm also human. But I'm trying to show you that all of this stuff comes from the Lord. And I can almost guarantee you that nobody's ever connected that in your mind. Because you've been beaten down. Once again, we've been beaten down by religious teachings that make you feel like that, that because God is spirit, 
Uh, he gave us, he made us three in one. He made us spirit, soul, and body. And that all parts of us didn't come from him. Just the spiritual part. That doesn't make any sense. That makes precisely zero sense because he carved our body out of the dust of the ground. That means he thought them up. He thought up the male body and all that comes with that. He thought up the female body and all that comes with that. And how in the world can you say that passion and love and romance and sex and children and family and marriage aren't just as much from God as all the other stuff you're not ashamed to praise him for? Because you're praising for the son and you're sure praising for money and you're praising for a house and you're praising for a private airplane and you're praising for all that. But then when it comes to your personal personals, then you're like, oh, we can't talk to God about that. And oh, blah, blah, blah. And then you just get all crazy. And just and that's why people are struggling. I'm talking about that in a minute, too, about people that are struggling in marriage and why. I'm going to get there. But what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to establish with all this is that all that comes from the Lord. And so I'm going to read uh, Revelation 2. Revelation 2, 1 through 5. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. You can't miss it. Just go to the end. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, hold on just a Holy Ghost filled minute. We're going to break down what the Lord just said. Now, if you've been following my channel, if you've been following my prophetic ministry, you know that the last two things I've done have been on basics. Christian basics, uh, uh, the actual work of the church versus the church work that they taught us when we first got saved. So you need to go back and watch them last two videos. And they're on YouTube and they're right here on Facebook called Basics, Basics Part 1 and Basics Part 2. And I've been talking about how, how religion and dogma and religious institutions have messed us up. Because God said the first thing was for us to love him. And the only way you can ever love him is if you first let him love you. But that ain't what they taught us when we first got saved. They told us we had to get busy. Don't be a bench warmer. Don't be a pew member. And they taught you how to do all this stuff, all this stuff. And that's why you now think being a good Christian is all the stuff you're doing. That's why you think that, because that's what they taught you in church. Too bad that's not what the Bible says. I'm finna break it down. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the pastors or the apostles or the messengers of the churches, and the lampstands are the churches themselves. Uh, Revelation 2.2, 2, I know your deeds. The Lord said, I know what you're doing. Your hard work. The Lord said, I'm looking right at all the hard work you're doing and your perseverance. You haven't given up. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. The Lord said, you have drawn some lines in your life and you are not compromising with the wicked. Lord, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. The Lord said, I know you uh, Ephesian Christians, you the church at Ephesus, there's some people that were saying they're apostles and you tested it to see if that was real and you found out they're not. You, you put them on blast. Y'all ain't no real apostles. You have persevered. Second time he's mentioned perseverance, not giving up, and have endured hardships for my name. In other words, the Lord said, you've been through some stuff. You've been through some, through some hard stuff and you dealt with it. You put up with it. You endured. You made it through for me and have not grown weary. You're not tired. You're still out there doing it. You're on the front lines for Jesus. And then the Lord said, yet. <laughs> he listed all the stuff they was doing. And then he said, yet. Yet I hold this against you. 
you have forsaken the love you had at first. That's why I started off talking about remembering what it was like when you first fell in love when you was young. The Lord is saying he remembers what it first was like when you first fell in love with him. And in spite of all the stuff you might be doing, he said, I'm still holding this against you. I'm still not. In spite of all what you're doing, that's why I keep trying to, I keep trying to drive the point home that we have been taught wrong by religion because I can't tell you the number of Christians that do just like Job. They defend themselves based on what they do and what they don't do, especially people that are super saved. Because super saved people got to speak in tongues for three hours before they pick their cereal. Super saved people got to wear dresses from their neck to their ankles like you still can't sin in a long dress. Super saved people say you can only watch G-rated movies if you watch something PG-13, oh, you would have gone back in the world. Your people is super saved, okay? The Bible says that the Lord can have a litany of all the stuff you're doing and yet still have something against you. But it gets deeper. The Lord said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. In other words, the Lord is like, remember what it was like when we first fell in love. Ain't that what Michael Jackson sang about? In this video with Eddie Murphy and Iman, remember the time we fell in love? Do you remember the time? Now, some of y'all super saved folks said, did you just quote Michael Jackson in a ministry video? Yes, I did. So he said, consider how far you have fallen. He said, remember what it was like when you first met Jesus, when you first got saved. And he says, repent and do the things you did at first. In other words, that you that I met when we first met is the you that I want. That love that we shared, says the Lord, when we first met is the love that I want. And in spite of all the good things that you're doing, I don't want a relationship, says the Lord, where you don't love me. All the stuff you're doing to serve me is great, but that's not cutting it if you don't love me, which is what the scripture teaches, which is why I keep telling you why God took his mighty hand and tore down all that religious stuff in 2020 and we didn't go to church for a year and a half. And people are steady trying to rebuild stuff that the Lord tore them down because the Bible says right here, I just read it to you, that the Lord can have a list of all the things that you're doing. But if you don't love him with that passion and that hunger and, and that excitement and that fervor like you did when you first got saved, the Lord said that I'm holding that against you in spite of all that you're doing. But then he says this, I told you it gets deeper. He says in verse five, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The Lord just told you that if you don't love Jesus, in spite of all you're doing for Jesus, you can lose your place in the kingdom. You can lose your light. Good God Almighty. I told you this stuff is deep. It hurt, gonna hurt your brain because it's not the kind of stuff you often hear in church or maybe never. Because church keeps telling you to get busy. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord listed all their business and said, yeah. Another translation says, nevertheless. In other words, I see all that what you're doing. I got to list all the good stuff that you're doing. You're out there on the front lines for me. But he said, nevertheless. He says, if you don't repent, if you don't learn how to, if you don't fall in love with me again, and if you don't love me like you did at first, you can lose your light in the kingdom. I all oh, see, I all. Oh. Oh, that's why you keep hearing me say, you better get a relationship with the Bible for yourself, written word. You better get a relationship with Jesus for yourself, living word. You better start to learn how to flow in a prophetic, rhema word. Because that religious stuff has messed us up. And now we have people defending themselves based on what they do or don't do, thinking that they're all right with Christ because they're doing all that work for them because they serving him with everything that they have. And the Lord said, I see all that and that's good, but not if you don't love me. And not if you don't love me the way you did when we first met. And the Lord said, if you don't go back to that, you can lose your light. He said, I'm gonna come to you and remove your lampstand from his place. 
Why do you think, hear me carefully, why you think so many churches die on the vine? This doesn't happen in every place, but haven't you ever noticed how certain churches are like the hot church? Do you know what I mean by that? Like certain actors are like the, the it girl or like the it dude. And all of a sudden they're like in all the movies. You ever notice that? <laughs> like if somebody blows up and they're the it girl or they're the it guy, all of a sudden they like in every other movie. See what I mean? Because they're, they're hot. They're, they're a hot actor of the day. And sometimes churches get that way too, especially now, because in the 90s, we entered into the age of the mega church. Remember, we, there was no such word before the 90s. And we entered into the age of the celebrity preacher because it wasn't about being on TV, even though there were people that had televangelistic ministries. It wasn't about that. But when it hit in the 90s and all of a sudden we switched from choirs to worship teams and all of a sudden it, it became about how big of a church you went to and whether or not your past was famous and a bunch of stuff like that. So the Lord says that if we don't repent and go back and love him, but so, so when a church is the hot church, have you ever noticed that sometimes, not all the time, sometimes churches are a hot church and then something happened and it just kind of fizzle out or they just fade away or they just, just something happened. And all of a sudden they, that was, that was the it place. That was the place. And then all of a sudden they just kind of aren't, the Lord just told you in some cases what's been happening, that you had all that stuff going on, all them worship teams, all them, all them smoke and mirrors, all them big overheads, all them guests, all that, but but you don't love me. Good God Almighty. Did, oh, 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 the Lord said you got all that going on, but it's not me that you love. You're doing all this stuff, but you don't love me. And have you noticed sometimes they just, they disappear as fast as they can. Have you ever noticed that? That doesn't happen. It's not true in every situation, but have you ever noticed that? That sometimes, you know, church has got this reputation and oh, it's hot. And oh, we got visitations from the Holy Ghost and God is doing this and blah, 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 blah. And then they just like dry up and go away. And you're like, what What happened to Pastor so-and-so? What happened to, to, you know, Elder so-and-so? And they just, you know why? Because the Lord said, all that what you're doing, doesn't mean anything to him if it's not him that you love in that intimate, passionate, first love kind of a way. Good God Almighty. Now, we know that we don't make love to God physically because, as Jesus says in John 4, 23 and 24, but a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we know we don't physically make love to the Lord, like, you know, a, an act of love making in the natural, an act of intercourse in the natural. But the Lord said, it's in here. It's in here. Where is your heart? Do you love me like you did when we first met? Do you say that? Remember, I started off reading Song of Solomon. Do you say the kinds of things to me that you did? When we first fell in love, do you delight in me, says the Lord, like you did when we first met? Because all that stuff you're doing don't make up for a lack of, of personal love with me. My, 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 my. I'm going to do my job. I'm a prophet. It's not my job. I don't, it's not my job to how people respond. It's my job to release the word the Holy Ghost gave me to release which is why I don't care what people think about me. Because when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me, did they like you? He's going to ask me, did you say what I told you to say? Okay, so, so however it was that you met Jesus, I stopped by to tell you that he didn't change. He didn't move because the Lord never changes. We change. And it's so easy to get so caught up in, in churchology until you done fell out of love with Jesus and now you think that because you're busy doing Jesus' work, that means something to him without the love connection. But he said it doesn't to the point where you can lose your light in the kingdom. I see. Mm, mm, I, mm, mm, I, mm. So the Lord tells us, like the old song say, that we need to go back to the old landmark, the thing that made you, made you first fall in love with the Lord. 
Do you remember what that was? Okay. Now that's the spiritual part. That's the us and Jesus part. Now I'm gonna dive in these last few minutes into the marriage part. This is the relationship with the man and the woman, like I started talking about talking about with Song of Solomon at the top of the teaching, at the top of the hour. Some people, their marriages are dry and dull and stale and all but dead. They're the walking dead. Your spouse is like a corpse you carry on your back. You don't have a marriage, you just live in the same space. That means you're barely roommates. How can we go from all that hot and heavy passion to barely an occasional kiss? How? Because the title of this prophetic word is, how are we going to be married and we don't have sex no time? So on the spiritual side, that applies to you and the Lord. How are you going to be married to Jesus and y'all don't have no intimate time? You so busy running around serving Jesus, but you ain't got no intimacy with the Lord. And I already told you in Matthew 7, 23, he said that if we don't know each other, all that stuff you're doing don't even count. I already told you, I already preached that, I already prophesied that. But in the natural, what if you got that same kind of thing? A lot of that is because a lot of people just missed their spouses. And a lot of people have spent the coin of their first love and their great love and it is now not attached to your spouse. That's the difference between our generation and you got to go all the way back to your grandparents and your great grandparents. They got together when they were young and they stayed together till they grew old and both of them died because what they experienced together was they were the only person they ever knew. Okay, I see I might have to do some more teaching on this because this is a very complex and intense subject, but a lot of people don't understand why that passion in a marriage is just felt like it is just kind of deflated. Ain't nothing there, just kind of stale. That's because y'all already spent that coin when you were single out there with other people. And then you don't have nothing left with your spouse. Because when we're living in sin, we got plenty of energy for sexual sin. There's nobody that's an exception to what I just said. If you living in sin, sexual sin, relationship sin, you got plenty of energy for your sin. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say, because we're all like that. No exceptions. No exceptions. There aren't any exceptions on the face of this planet till if you live in, in a wrong relationship sexually where you don't have plenty of energy for it and you make time for it. And then you get married and now you don't have nothing left for your spouse. That oh. You can't tell me that's not true because it is true. So that's a problem. So solution number one, you need to ask God to light a fire in your marriage to give you the same kind of desire for your spouse that you had when you were single and out there living in sin. Some of y'all don't even know you can talk to God like that. Some of y'all don't even know that's the prayer you need to pray. You need to say, God, I need you to light a fire between me and my spouse. I need you to give me the energy, the desire, the desire for them. I know some of y'all have been going to church for 20, 30 years. You never heard anybody say anything like that. But passionate romant, romantic connection is in the Bible. That's why I read Song of Solomon. And it comes from the Lord. That's why I talked about Genesis. So solution number one is you got to ask God to light a fire between you. All right, number one. Here comes problem number two. Problem number two is you don't seem to realize that you stood before God and took a vow. You said, I do, I will, I take. I take, I will, I do. I take, I do, I will. And then you got home and you said, I won't. How y'all going to be married and don't have sex no time? Some of y'all don't understand that the reason God is not honoring your marriage is because you did a bait and switch. You got married based on false advertising. You got them to marry you based on somebody that you are not. You did all that stuff before you got married just to get them to marry you because you wanted them to think that that's what life with you was going to be like. And now that you got them into marriage, now all of a sudden you don't have nothing for it, but you still you don't have nothing for your spouse, but you stood before God and you took a vow. That's what a lot of people don't get. And God takes vows very, very seriously. You stood before God and you swore to be her husband. You swore before God to be his wife. You said it for, before God, clergy, family, and friends. 
And now all of a sudden you got home and you just said now, well, later for that, and you don't have no responsibility. Yeah, no. Whatever you did to win them is what you're going to have to do to keep them. One more time. Whatever you did to win them, to get them to marry you, is what you're going to have to do to keep them. Because if the Lord already told you that just like if the love that you have for him ain't real, he going to remove you from your place in the kingdom. I stopped by to tell you that applies to marriage too. If y'all just doing the shake and bake and y'all just doing the okie doke, that marriage is not going to last. That marriage is going to fall apart. It's going to be removed. People are going to look up and they, oh, well, we're getting divorced. Oh, well, we're not together. Oh, well, well that marriage is going to move because it ain't real. Because you lied. You can't expect God to bless that. So what's the solution? The solution is you got to take off your mask and tell the truth. Tell the truth to the Lord first. And then number one, number two, tell the truth to yourself. Because you don't have no business standing before God, taking a vow, swearing to be someone's spouse. And you knew good and well, you had no intention of keeping up what you started while y'all was dating. You are a liar and you lied under oath. And God ain't going to never bless that. So you have to take that mask off and tell the truth because you got them to marry you based on false advertising and God's not going to honor that. And if you don't repent and make that love real, you're going to lose that marriage. It's going to be removed from its place. Problem number three. Some of y'all need to learn how to forgive. I know when you got married, what you expected was a perfect person. You don't understand how arrogant and conceited that is. I'm going to say that one more time. I know when you got married, you expected your spouse to be perfect. You have no idea that that is nothing but human pride. You have no idea how arrogant and conceited that is. You know why? Because by perfect, you mean perfect in your eyes. Who are you? You just clam breath. You in the same boat they in. Gravity fastens your feet to the ground. If you get cut, you bleed red. You breathe oxygen just like them. When you say perfect, you mean perfect according to you. And who are you? You ain't perfect. If you think you're perfect, you deceive because the Bible says if we say we have no sin, then we are deceived and the truth ain't in us. So you, I know you expected a perfect spouse. You mean perfect according to that movie that was playing in your head. But they're going to act like this and they're going to act like that because we married now. Yeah, you arrogant. That's what you are. So you ain't perfect. You don't know what perfect is. Only Jesus is perfect. Okay? So some of y'all need to forgive. So and don't tell me you can't love like that because you love somebody like that. If your spouse is not your first love and your spouse is not your great love, that means you had it already. You love them like that. Oh, Lord have mercy. When we were in love, we put up with a whole bunch of stuff. We have put up with a whole bunch of stuff with people we used in love with. And how are you going to stand before God and take a vow and marry somebody and now you ain't got nothing left in the tank? So some of y'all need to forgive. The, so the solution there is that you can only forgive as you feel and know that you are forgiven. So you have to ask the Lord to refresh, uh, as the Bible says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Do you know what the joy of the Lord actually is? The joy of the Lord is salvation without, uh, without works. Righteousness without works. That's actually the joy of the Lord. In other words, God makes me right with him and I didn't have to earn it. There's nothing I could do to save myself. I can't keep all the commandments. I can't cleanse myself of my sin. I didn't have to earn it. It's grace. He gave it to me as a gift. It wasn't a free gift on his part, meaning Jesus paid a brutal price for it, but he gave it to me for free. That's the joy of the Lord. It's righteousness apart from works. I don't have to try to keep the law. I don't have to try to dot every I, cross every T. God saved me by his grace and covered me with his blood. It's not something I had to do on my own. That's actually the joy of your salvation righteousness without works. So you have to ask God to rekindle the joy of your salvation in forgiveness because there's no condemnation in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he became every wrong thing you ever did. And when you believe that and receive that in your heart, Father God took his blood and wiped your account clean. And now when you confess, Father God takes that blood and wipes your account clean and you ain't gonna never see hell. You ain't gonna never see hell. You ain't going to hell because Jesus went to hell for you. Good God Almighty, I can stay right there. That's the joy of the Lord. Well, if you ask the Lord to refire that up in you, you realize that you are forgiven. And when you realize how much he's forgiven you for, good God Almighty, you can't hold somebody else's sins against them. 
how dare you hold somebody else to sin? I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about abuse. If somebody's abusing you, you have to get away from them. You forgive them, but you don't stay there and let them keep abusing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not an abuse situation. But when you realize and understand that you've been forgiven, how, how, how can you hold grudges against your, your spouse? How? And here come number four. I'm going to close on this one. Problem number four is some of y'all are just too busy. You don't have any scheduled time just to be with each other and make the googly eyes. Remember when you was young, you would just lay on the phone with somebody and boo, what you doing? Nothing. What you doing? Nothing. Y'all just listen to each other breathe. Do you remember that? You remember you didn't want to hang up the phone? You remember you'd be, well, this is old school. You'd be in your bed underneath the covers with the phone, hoping your parents didn't hear you because it's midnight on a school night and y'all going to see each other first period of my school anyway. But you're like, what you doing? Nothing. And it's midnight. You should have been asleep because you couldn't get enough. You're just listening to each other, breathe on the phone. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going to see you first period, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll be going to lunch, right? Because you couldn't get enough of them. Okay. Some of y'all need to do that because, because you're not, you don't have no time to make the googly eyes. So the solution, problem number four, is you need to schedule some time to make the googly eyes. Don't tell me it can't come back. Yes, it can. It can come back when you remember, like the Lord said, why you fell in love with him in the first place. Why'd you fall in love with him in the first place? Yes, it can come back. It can come back if you go back to what it was like when y'all first fell in love and y'all just sat on the phone and listened to each other breathe. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You have to make an effort, but yes, you can. 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 All right. So all the stuff I've said today applies to your walk with Christ and your marriage. So I'm going to do a quick review and I'm out. Number one, I started talking to the title of this prophetic word is how we're going to be married and don't have sex no time. And I started off talking about the Song of Solomon and how God created us in his image and what that means. We have a kingdom. We have someone to love. We can make little images of ourselves. Right in the middle of the Bible is a love book that gives you a blow by blow on how to stir up that passion and that connection and that heat in your marriage. Right there in the scripture. And we talked about the first, our first love. We talked about how women are designed to bond and women are designed to bond for life. How men, uh, we don't have a seal in our bodies, but we have a seal in our hearts whereby lives our great love, the sacrificial love of Christ. We talked about how when we're little, there's gender differences because women are always planning on being in love, even when they're very little girls, but not boys. That's why love tends to hit us like a freight train. But we get all that from God. We talked about how sex is not dirty. It comes from God. The power of reproduction to make little images of yourself comes from the Lord. Then we went to Revelation 2 and we talked about how the Lord has a list of all the good stuff you're doing for him because you're doing all that stuff for Jesus. And he said he got something against you if you don't love him like you did when y'all first met. And he said, if you don't repent and go back to the love that all that stuff you're doing is not going to stop him from removing your place in the kingdom. Good God almighty. And then we talked about how we don't make love to God physically, but it's in your heart. It's in the spirit. And if you don't feel that way about the Lord, he didn't move and he didn't change. You moved. You changed. Then we talked about problems in marriages and solutions. Problem number one, you know, if you got a dull, dry, stale marriage and you're like roommates, uh, part of our problem is because you spent that coin of first love and great love on other people. But the solution is to ask God to light a fire in your marriage to give you the same kind of desire that you have when you was out there living in sin when you were single. Problem number two, you stood before God and took a vow. If you just did false advertising, if you knew you had no intention of honoring that vow, God's not going to bless that. Solution, you got to take the mask off. You got to be real. Okay? Problem number three, some of y'all need to learn how to forgive. You're holding things against them. And the only way to forgive is to realize that you've been forgiven by Christ. And problem number four, some people are just too busy. 
But when you first fell in love, when you was a little kid, I know we got careers, I know we got all that, but y'all was on the phone, listening to each other breathe, and when you saw each other in school, you was making the googly eyes. Solution is some of y'all need to make time to make the googly eyes at your spouse again. Don't tell me it can't come back. It can't come back. Because it can come back if you do the stuff you did when it first sparked off, when you first ignited, all right? So again, name of this prophetic word is how we're going to be married and we don't have sex. No time. That applies to Jesus and that applies to your spouse. All right. So remember I told you uh, in every video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing to help me increase my reach. With this video, I'm going to ask you to share this as many places as you can. Because I know for a fact there's a lot of people that need to hear this prophetic teaching. They need to get over their guilt and shame about sexuality. They need to understand it comes from God. The problems they have in their marriage, feeling estranged from the Lord, all that stuff. And breaking off all that religious training and realizing that all the stuff you're doing for the Lord doesn't mean anything if you don't love him. Okay? So share this video. That's the one thing I'm going to ask you to do. Share this video in as many places as you can. Okay? Because we all need to fall in love with the Lord again because you don't want to spend a lifetime of serving him and he say, all that don't count because you didn't love me. Oh, good God almighty. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me live. Thank you so much uh, to those of you that uh, are watching this on YouTube. This is going to be on YouTube in about two hours. Uh, thank you to those of you that are sharing the video. God bless you. I will be here Sunday, my regular time. Now, last Sunday was 4th of July, so I pre-recorded that. But it's up there. You just got to click on the YouTube link, okay? This Sunday, I'll be here again live, 2.30 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time, for my regular uh, live prophetic word, okay? Thank you so much. God bless. And uh, thank you for tuning in. And my face is uh, all on the thing. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much. And uh, praise God. And I'll see you Sunday. <clears throat> and remember, we got to take this teaching seriously. We don't want God to remove our place in the kingdom. And we don't want to lose our marriages. Amen. And God bless. And I'll talk to you soon.